Here we are. Here we are. We have entered the land of the lost uh, in our in our quest to cover apparently every movie that came out in 2009 with the 2.4 rating. Um, we move on to our second consecutive episode of doing such a thing uh, as we talk about a Will Ferrell movie. I think this is his first appearance on the show. Am I wrong? Great question. And we have been covering more comedies, especially recent ones that yes. feature plenty of SNL alumni. So uh, I can't say that with authority, but it, it certainly sounds true. This is Will Ferrell <laughs> and uh, Danny McBride's first appearance on the show as an actor, as a performer. <laughs> Yes, uh, and it'll be interesting to get into. Danny McBride is um, a figure who I feel like for a while was pretty well liked. And then over time, both comedy fans and horror fans have reasons to complain about the guy. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we have any of those same complaints as we talk about this movie. Um, but, uh, you know, here we are. <laughs> here we are. We are not that bad. We are deep into season two, uh, getting deeper and deeper with every episode. Uh, my name is Connor, a.k.a. Dr. Dick Marshall, and uh, I, of course, am joined by my everyday co-host, the illustrious Gabe Tice. Gabe, uh, how are you doing on this uh, on this wonderful day we have today? Well, I'm about to cancel you for that, uh, <laughs> for that Chicago <laughs> Mohawks ball cap you, you got on. Uh, and that'll be the, the Blackhawks. You put on your uh, <laughs> Blackhawks. Sorry, are you going to cancel <laughs> me now? Yes, very much so. Um, no, but no, I'm, it's, uh... I'm feeling energized. I just watched a movie with dinosaurs and aliens and Will Ferrell, so I have plenty to talk about. Yeah, uh, this film, Land of the Lost. Based uh, of on course... a television series yes. from the 1970s. Yes, famous sci-fi television series, I'd say. Yeah, famous uh, enough, well, you know. Yeah, I don't uh, yeah, know well how enough well known. It survived. Uh, um, when this movie came out, and I was but a child, I had no knowledge or recollection of the original show. I think that agreed. would go for most people who were not alive in the 1970s. Oh yeah, and uh, now I'm I'm curious going back on this uh, for our listeners. Um, what uh, was if at all, your background with uh, this Land of the Lost movie. I can actually vividly remember seeing the trailer in theaters and being really excited for it. It had two of my favorite things as a child. First, it, it had dinosaurs. That's a big thing. And this is fresh right. off of the King Kong remake by Peter Jackson. Yes. Felt like I was getting this whole toy box of dinosaur movies a renaissance <laughs> of of kind of uh you know lost world dinosaur movies it was it felt magical at the time and then it also had will ferrell who was one of my favorite actors one of my favorite comedians and just one of my favorite people as a kid like let's go back to the 2000s i feel like will ferrell is is a uh is a really big figure in just the world of comedy in the aughts right he gets famous on snl has a lot of um really beloved characters has an amazing impression of george w bush that kind of <laughs> supplants the real george w bush as the as the bush we all really remember so then will ferrell is one of those snl guys that actually does break it uh, he breaks into uh the mainstream he breaks into movies in a big way um Step Brothers comes a little later, but what I primarily loved him for was a little movie called Elf, which I would argue is the last great Christmas movie, the last great Ooh. original Christmas movie for a new generation. And then Will Ferrell also starts proving his dramatic talents with movies like Stranger Than Fiction. So to me as a kid, he was actually the the kind of primary example of a comedian with uh with serious talent with like deep talent he is uh, a guy for a long time that i really look up to and i always look forward to uh, seeing his new movies provided that i'm old enough to see them right because i'm still a young and 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 all not all of his movies are family friendly uh so i'm really excited to see the land of the lost when it comes out and then I ask my dad to take me and he says, no, 
And I say, why, Dad? He says, because the reviews are terrible. So we didn't see it. Mm. And it just never really crossed my mind since I saw the previews in 2009. Wow. Uh, and all this time later, uh, your first time watching it is due to a show that talks about movies that are all pretty much poorly. Not played. unlike Dr. Rick Marshall, I am kind of uh, trudging into a a land between space and time. I'm traveling to a nether realm where Land of the Lost is still the big uh, summer movie event or one of the big summer releases on the horizon feels as <laughs> forgotten as dinosaurs themselves at that point like it feels like an ancient relic to me already even though it's just from 2009 something really interesting about this movie and and my history like i grew up on this film uh i wouldn't say grew up i mean by you know by then i was i believe 11 when this movie came out so you know uh i i probably have seen it over a dozen times uh that's not <laughs> it's not overstating anything uh <laughs> my family loves this movie uh the shout out to one of our listeners uh julie who who uh brought this movie to me i've had this on my list since the beginning of of the show um uh, but much like the movie in the minds of the masses uh, just kind of kept slipping through the cracks. You know, there were more interesting things to talk about, more things coming up. Uh, you know, our show especially, we we like to kind of follow some trends sometimes. You know, if, uh, if it's spooky season, we'll cover some spooky movies and things of that nature. So things get in the way and we never got a chance to cover this. But um, as I sort of alluded to, the masses also have sort of forgotten about this movie because it was one of those films that like, you kind of saw it everywhere before it came out. Um, posters in the theater trailer every time your favorite show cuts to commercials i mean this was one of those movies that just kind of was showing up everywhere as, as a lot of will Fe ferrell vehicles were for quite a few years um i don't feel like that's much the case now uh, but like the 2000s late 2000s early 2010s like every show you watched you'd go to a commercial and there'd be some will ferrell movie coming he out. was running things like he was, he was yeah. on top of his game he owned the 2000s as far as uh you know and the 2000s people say that was the last great era of comedy movies of comedy as a genre really kind of owning the moment culturally and will ferrell i think is is basically if he's not the face of comedy from that period he is a part of that that new rat pack that was going on with him and all the other uh adam mckay regulars but this, yeah, but, you know, I mean, I, not to cut you off, but, no, you yeah. know, there's something very important about the narrative here where Land of the Lost fits in. I think this is, kind of kills Will Ferrell, the leading man. This movie's flopping combined with the fatigue people were getting from some of his more subpar releases that were uh, coming out around this time, like uh, what Blades of Glory. I think that's a few years before this. Blades of Glory came out a couple of years before this in 2007. Um, Semi-Pro didn't yeah. do very well. Um, and That uh, was but... the first Will Ferrell movie that I remember not liking. That's one of the first yes. comedies I remember consciously not liking. See, but he... This is what's weird about Will around this time is like, usually when you see that in an actor's career, like that's... Once they start a downslope, it's, it usually takes them a while to kind of spike back up and they usually don't have a lot of like <laughs> big jolts in success or or uh, at least on a critical matter um but he did i mean like blades of glory didn't do very well people didn't like it very much uh and around that same time uh he did semi pro 2 didn't do too well people didn't like it too much definitely got some love a little later but step brothers came out a year before this in 2008 that's true that's so true. Step Brothers is one of the most beloved comedies I can remember. And and the next year after this, after Land of the Lost in 2010, The Other Guys comes out with Mark Wahlberg, which is another movie that did fairly well. But notice a trend here, okay? Step Brothers and The Other Guys, these are uh, considered... He's got a buddy. So he's got a buddy. It's no longer Will Ferrell stars. It's Will Ferrell and blank. It's Will Ferrell and John C. Riley will ferrell and mark Wahlberg. uh not to take these uh 
these movies away from Will. I mean, people still fondly remember these movies and they remember right. him uh, very fondly from them. And probably some of his most uh, cherished gags uh, come from his buddy comedy era. But it's still quite different from Will Ferrell, the man who made Elf or made Stranger Than Fiction. Like he was the marquee name almost unto himself. He was. I mean, he he kind of became um, he kind of stepped into a role that I think some people in the at least in the comedy world would have expected Adam Sandler to be in. I mean, not that Adam Sandler didn't continue to have success after he started, you know, after critics really kind of caught up to him <laughs> um, and started thinking the same way he thinks about himself, which is that, you know, he he doesn't have any talent. Uh, I don't think that I love Adam Sandler, uh, but Will Ferrell sort of like was the it was almost like the torch was past and he started his movies started doing well and the critics seemed to really like them and the audiences seemed to really like them um and there there were there's always been the will ferrell naysayers you know there's always been the people who say he's not funny who say that he plays the same character in every movie who say yeah. that his humor is childish around um, this time too in 2009 maybe exactly he star he guest stars in season seven of the office where he plays uh, D'Angelo Vickers, the man who will supposedly <clears throat> replace Steve Carell's Michael Scott, who, of course, was was famously leaving the show in that season. And and fans rejected this en masse. They did like this was, I think, the most uh, public rejection of Will Ferrell uh, up to that point, because it's not just that Will Ferrell has a new uh a vehicle or he's goofing off with his buddies and maybe that you know that doesn't work for some people he is coming in to supposedly replace uh one of the most uh popular television uh characters of the 2000s right and I, this is probably not really that big of an episode in wolf errol's whole career but public perception wise it's easy to again uh, again to kind of start tracking those diminishing returns. And then you get to Land of the Lost. And I wonder, having watched it um, for the first time in 2024, far away from, you know, <laughs> Will Ferrell mania, I wonder, was this movie bombing a result of people just getting tired of Will Ferrell? Whew. That I think that might be an interesting thing to look at throughout the the episode, but I mean I can say this like I mean even the next he had two hits the next year I mean the next year one year later yeah. he had That's two true. big hits in in the other guys in Megamind which Megamind he's not I mean his voice is pretty prominent he's not one of those guys That's who not like a Will Ferrell movie a okay you remember the trailers for this movie I mean it was a Will Ferrell product yeah. Right. He was as synonymous with this movie as Steve Jobs is with Apple products. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 2009, certainly you're correct. Yes. So the reason I ask this is because, and I guess this is spoiling my final thoughts later, but this is like the definition of a not that bad experience. Like knowing people hated this, knowing this kind of stole the, the momentum for its star. And uh, just re I remember the reaction being scathing. Like, what is Will Ferrell doing? He's embarrassing himself. He's wasting our time. People were mad. <laughs> and the interesting thing about comedy is that you can actually measure, like, numerically how well the movie's working for you by the number of laughs it gets from you. I laughed so much more at this at this forgotten 2009 flop than I do at some of the more acclaimed comedy films that come out today what that says is probably something quite depressing uh it might just be a testament <laughs> to uh the staying power of will ferrell who i still do cherish as one of those great um comic minds of, of my generation right so i'm gonna throw it back to you you're the person who grew up with this movie you saw it um however many times right <laughs> uh, over a dozen i guess yeah uh, a lot how has your relationship with this movie changed? Have you always liked it as much as you have? Has it fluctuated for you? What's the, what's the journey there? 
so I went through a phase, uh, and it definitely was a phase, and I knew in the time that it was going to be one, um, but so I watched this movie all of the times that I watched it up until this point in time was between the years of 2009 to 2013 ish. So like it had been about 10 years since I had seen this. <laughs> um, and, uh, I, and the, the reason for that is because as I started to get more into movies, I think if you, if you get into movies the way that I did and the way that I was looking at them, you reach a point where you become one of the snobs. And yeah. I think a lot of people have been there if you're movie people, but I did that for a while. And so um, Will Ferrell was uh, a dumb comedy guy and I don't, I don't like dumb comedies anymore at that point. <laughs> um, and then once I got back into it, uh, I just wanted to focus my energy on the ones that I, I consistently remembered or that I hadn't seen yet. So Land of the Lost was one that even though I had watched it so much and like, again, big in my household, still quote the movie to this day. Um, I was actually going to have a surgery. And because of this movie, uh, while I was getting ready to, to go in for the surgery, my father said to the people who were helping me, let me play his favorite song and play share. Do you believe in life after love? Um, uh, <laughs> because of this movie that that's why that's a part of our family, you know, canon or whatever. So, um, this movie was, it was a big part of it, but I, I took a long break from this and from most Will Ferrell stuff. I'd say I probably paid attention to the stuff that everybody else did. You know, um, I'd go back and revisit the Step Brothers, and I'd go back and revisit Anchorman and I saw Anchorman too. When that Anchorman, how could I forget Anchorman? Oh, I mean, it's one of my favorite comedies of all time is Anchorman. I, that's I think like, a, that's a movie that's not only a classic, it's a coronation. Here oh, yeah. you go, Will Ferrell. You are the next big thing. All bow down to yes. you. People, celebrities will be rushing to cameo in your movies uh, to get some of that goodwill. Uh, and you get yeah. some of that here because the movie opens up with Will Ferrell and the now disgraced Matt Lauer. <laughs> yes <laughs> how well this movie has aged that the Ooh. instant premise of the movie is that matt lauer is a rat is it is a dick bag <laughs> a dick <laughs> needs bag to be proven wrong <laughs> the <laughs> thesis the, of the, the movie. premise of this the, movie is matt lauer can suck it That's the what theme this movie of is the about. movie is matt lauer can suck it <laughs> I think we should just get into the movie, man. I, we I'm, need to get I'm, into the I'm movie. I'm so excited. So, so okay, we already established that this is an established property. Um, you know, as we get into the movie, um, I, I'm curious now, 2024, Gabe. Obviously, you then no knowledge of, uh, or may, n maybe slight remote knowledge of the original Land of the Lost. No, uh, no. Any knowledge. knowledge going into this movie at all this time around, while you're actually watching it for the first time of the original show. Yeah, any knowledge, feelings about it, anything like that, any connection that you were kind of comparing it against? No, no, no. The well, what I'm comparing this movie to again is this beloved genre of lost world dinosaur monster movies. I okay. mean, what a what a cherished genre of film, just giving oh, us hits man. after <laughs> hits after hits, whether it be the original Silent, uh, the Lost World whether it be the 1962 remake where instead of stop motion dinosaurs, the producers, <laughs> the cheap ass producers got geckos, put them against a green screen <laughs> and had them fight one another. And I am not exaggerating that one <laughs> iota, please look this up. But then of course you got the King Kongs, you've got the Jurassic parks. I want dinosaurs. I want dinosaurs i want weird mystical creatures i want uh good guy monsters and bad guy monsters and i want uh, a team of ragtag explorers that nobody takes seriously nobody believes them i want them to be stuck in this world and have to navigate it and there is definitely a set of expectations and hopes that i have going into this film just as a uh as a tribute or a parody of of that entire type of movie 
Okay. And I, I'm, I'm curious here. Uh, you, you're a big fan of those, and you haven't shied away from that. And I've, I've always been somebody to say that those movies really weren't for me uh, when I was a kid. And, and I've only come around to those kind of movies more recently. Uh, you know, and I even brought Godzilla from 98 onto the show, uh, which is something that younger me would never have even thought to do. Um, so uh, I, I want to ask you, in that sense, you know, before we get into the 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 debate about the comedy, before we get into the debate about, you know, the characters and how they work in this world, how did the elements of that sort of comedy adventure, even some sci-fi thrown in there, uh, how did that kind of combine to to that experience in the movie for you watching this time? Well, the, the science fiction element? Just the element uh, that you were sort of searching for in a movie mm. like this, sort of that that comparison that you make. How did it? How did it compare to what your expectations were for the movie? Yeah, that is definitely the prism in which I watched it, and the and you know this movie I think works on a couple of different levels. Uh, and one area where it actually, it, it I have a more rocky relationship with the movie is is how it functions as a parody or a send up of those original movies because okay. the humor isn't really uh contrived from playing off of those tropes it's it's contrived off of the style of humor that Will Ferrell and Danny McBride have already uh you know made a formula out of you know Will Ferrell and this kind of goes to what you know, some people have criticized him for, I don't think it's always the case, but you know, he definitely has a, a style. He has a sense of humor. Right. Uh, and it always works for him and it always works for me. He just, I guess, cause I grew up with the guy. Yeah. Um, I have an instant affection for his, his kind of like non sequiturs and his, <laughs> his, his weird delivery. I mean, he's a, he's a funny guy and Danny McBride, could be the MVP of the movie uh, just with his trailer trash uh, <laughs> redneck persona. He's like, if, uh, if Rob zombie made a, made a, a, a frat comedy, he would create a character like Danny McBride. Now, that being said, almost none of that has to do with dinosaurs or, no. <laughs> or any of the stuff I just laid out. So it's kind of incidental in that way. Uh, that being said, I can tell you uh, something that delighted me about the movie, which was the design of the aliens. And that felt oh, yeah. for a brief moment like the filmmakers were allowed to make a true, uh, unabashedly cheesy tribute to corny ass B movies uh, from yesteryear. Uh, so this movie succeeds more as a Will Ferrell comedy uh, with, with some, you know, interesting use of uh science fiction and fantasy uh, i can name a couple of gags that play off of those tropes but it succeeds largely more on that level that it does as a uh, dinosaur movie yeah I, I it feels like there's so much more to this than to just call it like oh hey look it, will ferrell has a dinosaur movie coming out and i know that that is sort of what the marketing played up uh, you know, they very much played up the, oh, here's Will Ferrell and here's him being funny and here's some dinosaurs. Um, but I like that that's not what this movie is all about. I mean, I, and the aliens are a perfect example of, of something that just works for me and, and shows me that um, they have maybe not as much of affection for those sort of creature adventure movies but uh definitely for those b those b movie sci-fi vehicles of the 70s and the 60s and things like that uh along with obviously the the, the major objective of this movie is, is always going to be and was always going to be playing to the comedy the, the comedic fashions of <laughs> of will ferrell and danny mcbride and that was what it was going to be but i do appreciate that there are scenes where you can really see that there is a love for stuff that came before it. And the aliens, I think, are a perfect example of that. You can see the rubber on these things, man. You can see it just... You're damn right. <laughs> when when they're stepping and when they're moving. I wouldn't so have it any other way, man. man. I wouldn't have it any other way. I loved it. It was... It was see, like stuff like this make a movie so charming and fun and not in like a demeaning way where it's like, Oh, that's so cute. You know, they got the, you can clearly see the, you know, <laughs> the latex. It's bending. almost like, uh, and people probably don't think this is, uh, 
a fair comparison, but it's like Galaxy Quest, right? Yes. The whole would, premise say absolutely. is we are doing a send up of um, a corny, kitschy, uh, nostalgic vision of science fiction. And we are not going to shy away. If anything, we're going to indulge in all of the the cut corners and the weirdness, especially the weirdness. Uh, and that is going to be the the uh, the bricks of which we construct this this magnificent piece of work. This is not um this is not a fine immaculate work like Galaxy Quest. You could definitely make the case that Galaxy Quest is is uh you know some kind of a masterwork in its own right i know there are definitely people who belong to that it has yeah, an extremely the... devoted following mm -hmm. which i do not think land of the lost does i'd be curious no. to meet somebody who uh has like a land of the lost tattoo or something Ooh, good idea but right you know <laughs> but it does i mean it does kind of approach a charm like that it i read reviews where they were just going on and on about what were the filmmakers thinking who is this for i think the audience is pretty clear who it's for and if if you think it's silly or a waste of time i mean that's on you but i mean there's <laughs> definitely an audience for this and you know i was thinking of more movies in this vein like the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy even army yes. of darkness came across my mind yes. a few times now you know I don't like this movie as much as any of those examples, but it it is it is following uh, a playbook that has been proven. It's been proven to work. They can make it work. Uh, I guess I can bring up something that clashes with some of the positives I have, which is the the total eyesore that is most of the VFX in this movie. Uh, the green screen, the uh, just the the creation of this world i mean it was way too ambitious i think for whatever the crew was uh was qualified for or what this director was qualified for you know they got a comedy director they didn't get peter jackson even though they were trying to make a skull island of their own but man i swear i could see the effects rendering before my eyes at any given time like that's how choppy and laggy and outdated it felt at times mm. I'm gonna okay. I'm not gonna completely disagree with you with how they looked, but I will raise this: Is the fact that this movie was a little over ambitious, or seemingly was a little over ambitious with what it was trying to do, not a perfect tribute in its of in and of itself to those '70s sci-fi movies that were again overly ambitious and and created effects that we only love today because of how ridiculous they were uh and i know cgi doesn't have the same kind of heart but like that to me adds to my experience while watching this movie i'm an extremely shallow uh critic when it comes to this <laughs> i have a pretty simple rule if if you're over ambitious with your practical effects um with your with your you know costuming your makeup uh, your set dressing give me more of that all day every day <laughs> i want that injected straight into my veins i want i honestly if we could have uh every blockbuster look like a forgotten episode of doctor who i would not complain but <laughs> that's practical effects if you take the same attitude and the same sloppiness and the same um over ambition to cgi i want to stab out my eyes and i'm not exaggerating that much it is just an eyesore for me to look at it's charmless it is oh, wow. it, it, and not to say the movie as a whole is charmless but gags that should land for me or even gags that i should be inclined to like uh they rub up against my eyes man they Ooh. my eyeballs are not pleased by the sight of many of these visual gags just because of what a what uh, how much they make me cringe on instinct. And again, I'm very transparently, transparently shallow on this. Is there one that's really necessarily more valid than the other in terms of a viewing experience, practical versus CGI? Not really, not really. I'm not arguing right. from that technical uh, side of the argument. I'm talking subjectively what my it's eyes like thing. looking at and yeah. what they don't. 
and this came out at a bad time, by the way, for <laughs> for CGI, for CGI in comedies, for CGI in action comedies, adventure comedies. Right. Okay, two years before this, you get Journey to the Center of the Earth 3D. Talk about career killers. People neglect to mention this when we talk about the kind of downfall of Brendan Fraser, but that's a big one. Well, I mean, even like, so, so I have like a soft spot in my heart for, and I know, I don't believe you've seen this movie, I think in conversation, but like the mummy returns has really terrible VFX. I mean, like infamously. So the rock it is probably the movie, most infamous example of terrible right. CGI. I don't think it should be. I think like spawn 97 probably should be, or, or, but or more people saw more, the mummy Returns. Right. I know um, that kind of CGI has a, I, I have a soft place in my heart mm -hmm. for, but like, uh, even like going to the next movie in that series. I mean, Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, uh, that was one of the biggest things I hated about it was the VFX. And so I understand it to an extent. Um, I'll say in this movie, it definitely added to it. Like I can think of every moment that I, that I thought the CGI was just absolutely terrible. And one of which, how much it added to my enjoyment of what was happening. I mean, the, mm. I, I, there's a scene I can think of for a perfect example is that Will Ferrell shows up uh, to help save the day riding on the back of a dinosaur. And first, it just looks terrible right then, but then he slides then, like, off he of it. And that's what I wrote tail. in my notes, Dude, that I can see the effects rendering before my very I eyes. loved it. It, it made okay. me laugh so much harder, because if that would have looked good, okay, that would have been like kind of funny because they were doing a joke with it. But because okay. it looks so terrible, I was laughing my ass off. It was perfect for me. This is the best way I can put it, for sure. We're talking about the difference between the watchability of an Ed Wood movie versus a Nouvelle Bowl movie, right? Oh, both of we? those men. Both. I, I, I'm going to make the case because I think both of those men uh, don't have any talent in the traditional sense. They have no <laughs> understanding of cin cinematic language, but. Uh, we affectionately, I think with genuine affection, uh, still watch Plan 9 from Outer Space. Uh, we watch movies about Ed Wood, uh, Johnny Depp, and Tim Burton. Uh, a great movie. Yeah. Decided to make a movie about this guy because they actually adored uh, his work. His, his cheap, quick, hack job uh, movies. <laughs> well, and Tim Burton's used that as an inspiration in some of his films. Uh, like I believe infamously he he referenced Ed Wood with uh, um, that scene in Pee Wee's with the headlights, you know, that he's got the headlight glasses and he illuminates sure. and it's all these like stuffed animals. <laughs> like, no, yeah, the, I mean, so yeah, that that was yeah. The the affection for Ed Wood was very sincere in right. that movie. You're never gonna get uh, that kind of a movie for Uwe Boll. Who gives a shit about Uwe Boll? I mean, he might be a fun You're guy right. to clown on, but. Don't tell me you want to have an Uwe Boll marathon or that you oh. uh, want to watch a documentary about Uwe Boll or be in the yeah. same room as Uwe Boll. He <laughs> might assault you. Certainly not. No, he <laughs> will likely assault you. Um, that is a likely thing to happen. I don't but, want to get sued, man. He's very likely to sue. I That is that is joking. I'm joking. Um, uh, I, I'm not scared to get punched by him, but I'm certainly scared of him suing me. I'm joking. Um, well, see, but here's the thing, though, is I don't know that it comes from the same place that it would in an Uwe Boll movie. Like, I, mm. I feel, I almost feel them knowing their limitations in this movie and just deciding to do it anyway. And mm. for some, maybe that doesn't work. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am. But no, I think you're making a comedy, good case. I, I'm I not know. even disagreeing with you. It's, it's like going back to the Godzilla 98 debate. Right. of of the effects on that movie versus uh the toho godzilla movies at their worst and at their worst the toho movies look really bad right shoddy um to, some, to say the least <laughs> to say the least yes. uh, and you know we're we're in a renaissance for godzilla now after godzilla minus one be, you know that became the first godzilla film to ever be nominated at the academy awards but for a very, very long time, people have the same idea about Godzilla that they do about this Land of the Lost show that uh, that's being spoofed here. But more important than the effects or any of that, I think, is our actors here, our, our core trio of actors. Yes. So I think we should 
get into that there. So obviously Please. we have Will Ferrell starring as Dr. Rick Marshall. Yes. Let's go ahead and just get right into the question of funny or not funny. Is he funny in this movie? Because there's a right answer and there's a wrong answer. I don't know that there is a right or wrong answer with this. There is. Uh, and, and this is coming from somebody who thinks he is fucking hilarious in this. Uh, I, I laugh a lot. Uh, and it, it's not um, facetious at all. I think he's hilarious in this. He is fucking hysterical in this movie. <laughs> that is the correct answer. Yes. I don't fair. accept the idea that he sucks or blows or isn't a... I mean, if you don't like Will Ferrell, that's one thing. But this is not a fall from grace here. Will Ferrell no. is doing what Will Ferrell does best. And he's doing it with uh, with dinosaurs and aliens straight out of classic uh, 60s Star Trek. Those are perfect scene partners for him. Which, by the way, I do want to say, before I forget this, they did get Leonard Nimoy to cameo in this they movie did. as the voice of the Zarn. Um which is very cool. I just wanted to throw that out there. Definitely shows that heart they have for that that sort of sp- what they're spoofing. I guess this I almost feels like they like they wish they could have made a parody of Star Trek. Of course, Some they of couldn't does. get the rights. Yeah, right. So they they bought a much cheaper IP and kind of uh, smuggled in all of the the jokes that they want that they would have used for a Star Trek movie. Now, again, I haven't seen Land of the Lost. Maybe Will Ferrell is the biggest fan of Land of the Lost. I'm, I bet he is. But actually, I, I, I have a point I would love. I think this is the perfect time to bring it up. Can I veer yeah, into that? Let's do it. Let's do it. So for those who want to condemn Will Ferrell for this movie, I want to bring up a, a counterexample that proves uh, how what he's doing is working. Uh, compared to uh, a similar approach that famously did not work, which was uh, Seth Rogen's Green Hornet movie. It's a good comparison, I think. Did you see that movie? Very, yes, I did. Yeah, once. <laughs> That's all it took. <laughs> I saw it um, more times than I care to admit. Oh, boy. More time, not, And I think... Uh, that's such a weird movie. That's one of the oddest attempts at at a, at a superhero movie um, that'll probably ever happen, really. But Seth Rogen can't interact really with any of the actual Green Hornet ness of the movie. You know what I mean? He is right. permanently stuck writing for himself and writing for. Uh, anything that would have flown in super bad like him and Cato they are almost indistinguishable from Michael Sarah and Jonah Hill's relationship in super bad it's like uh, Seth Rogen couldn't escape that that mind dungeon and you know I, I know a lot of people really like Seth Rogen and he's had a lot of successes since then namely the the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie uh, Mutant Mayhem that was a fine film. Not sure how much it's really good. creative involvement he had, but he produced it. But compared to this, there's, you know, it's like you're watching actors actually work with material. You know what I mean? Like Will Ferrell is actually there playing off of the material. Whereas uh, like, like Danny McBride would make a movie right after this with future Halloween director and Antichrist, I guess, uh, David Gordon Green, uh, called Your Highness. And I, I never saw the full movie, but take any gag, any quip or dialogue or whatever, and do the test of imagining does it need to be in a medieval fantasy sword and sorcery parody no it does not it could have gone in any project by danny mcbride so i'm gonna say something that might be considered a bold thing to say here um could be considered a hot take in some form forms or fashions i think this is 
potentially aside from I'll, I'll say in the in the world of film okay i believe this is the best usage we've seen of danny mcbride i i am a danny mcbride fan i just want to say that first off first and foremost i'm not somebody who jumped on the disrespect train as soon as the halloween movies came out um i actually like that trilogy especially the final movie in said trilogy um however um I've seen I've seen some of Eastbound and Down. I believe that that's probably the role he was made for. But what I love about Danny McBride in this movie kind of plays to what you've been discussing so far. But also, I think it goes a little further than that because he's able to play into this material really well. He's sort of your fish out of water character, <laughs> um, not really prepared. You got two scientists and then some fireworks salesman who wants to build a casino. Um, it's pretty awesome to see him kind of do that fish out of water stuff and to play into some of the sci-fi elements and some of the adventure elements in the movie, um, his own way, his relationship with, <laughs> with Chaka <laughs> is pretty hilarious. Uh, That's a but what prime I love... example of what I mean, right? He has yeah. an actual relationship with Chaka. With a monkey that, that cannot speak English. No, um, but they, uh, they understand each other because yes, because, uh, that's that's what fine writing can accomplish, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And which, by the way, is uh, is Yorma from uh, Lonely Island who plays yes, Chaka, is. which is so funny. Now, um, I should bring but... up that I did hate Chaka and I oh. I detested him a little bit. Um, was pretty repulsed by him right off the bat. When I saw that he wasn't going to be as present in the movie as I had feared, he is not a Jar Jar Binks level of uh of like shit on your shoe he is just he kind of pops up now and then i think for very very uh well-timed gags my favorite interaction maybe in the whole movie <laughs> is when danny mcbride tripping on some kind of you know uh jungle oh, the, shrooms the, yeah the jungle narcotics <laughs> is asking shaka if he's a cop if he's Dude, secretly a police scene. officer. I love the scene where they they first meet Chaka and and um, Holly convinces Chaka that that uh, Rick Marshall is some kind of like god and and that he needs to be worshipped like he's like a king and he's like yes I am I will be your master I will be fair and this and that and then the dinosaur shows up and they're like we need to run Chaka lead us and then they look down and he's gone <laughs> like he's like he's like hundreds of feet ahead of them. And all of that stuff where, where Rick is trying to be this master to Chaka, I think that humor works perfectly. Um, Definitely works to Will Ferrell's strength. Oh, 100%. Perfectly. Yeah, where he's yelling, you know, bad Chaka. You know, it's it's just, it's ridiculous. Like, what are they doing? I think, I think one of his big styles or one of the big archetypes that he does so well is the bumbling authority figure. That's why he yes. excelled at playing George W. Bush. Right. Right. Like to see this man child uh, try and fail to convince other people of his authority, which is a pretty similar premise to the Green Hornet reboot. It just uh, I don't know. I almost <laughs> want to do an episode on that movie one day, but that would be definitely a postmortem because I'm not in the business of trying to to, you know, defend that movie too much. But maybe a guest will bring it. Oh, who knows? Who knows? Maybe we can do a fuck it episode. <laughs> It just, it's that bad, Green Hornet. <laughs> but, you know, bringing up Chaka, there is a, an ugly point that we have to address, right? So I wrote down in my notes right after Chaka's introduction, oh, to be a woman in one of these aughts bro comedies. And of course, I wrote this down after the extensive, the extensive gag of all the men fondling Holly's breasts. Yes. Um, as she tries to communicate with this native. Uh, we have one woman in the cast um, failing to recall her name right now, but uh, she plays Holly, the scientist who actually is really the protagonist in the sense that she's the one responsible for this expedition. She's the one who inspires uh, the most change in our characters, and she's easily the most competent, which is how these 
douchey comedies of the era kind of deflected like no we're not misogynist the women they're the real heroes or they're really competent and the guys are a bunch of you know they're bumbling assholes which you see the logic of that on paper for sure but then you still have the situation of the the highly intellectual woman still falls in love with the schlubby loser that in in the case of this movie almost gets her killed many times Mm. okay i see where you're coming from on that but i I don't necessarily see it the same way in this movie and i think the reason is i i could definitely see where somebody would go a little bit further and say like oh this is a guy who kind of um inspired somebody who's who's sort of in a position higher than them who is uh you know uh, eventually falls in love with them and maybe that power dynamic is off. I could, I could sort of see that argument forming for some people. Um, but it's clear from the beginning that she's got a fascination with this guy's work because he's not just a bumbling idiot. He's, he's one of truthfully the most brilliant minds in science in according, according to this world, right? And he's somebody who gets written off and, and she still finds it fascinating and believes him in his theories and puts her career and her life really yeah. on the line for this guy. So I can see this a little bit more. Uh, by the way, her name is Anna Friel. She's uh, pretty much known really well for her television series in the 2000s, Pushing Daisies. Um, it was a pretty popular show that got canceled, I think, prematurely, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but uh, yes. Yeah, Brian she, Fuller she was behind Holly. that behind yes, that show. Yes. Um, and she she plays Holly in this movie. Um, I actually quite liked the character. I, I thought they... Uh, I liked her too. I thought they treated her better than a lot of movies like this would have. <laughs> Well, it's really interesting that you say that because she gets groped many times and uh, halfway through the movie, obviously, uh, tears off her, you know, the legs of her pants and uh, strips down to just her undershirt so that the rest of the movie she's running around um, <laughs> barely covered. <laughs> she's, you know, navigating this this mysterious jungle. So I want to like, I'm going to meet you halfway. Like, of course, that's how the movie justifies her attraction to Will Ferrell. I just like knowing women in real life. I just don't always see this idea of like a professional respect translating to sexual chemistry. Like, especially like in the world of academia, like maybe I say this because my wife is in academia and I hope that whenever she comes across, you know, somebody else's research that she admires, she doesn't also like start, having wayward thoughts about them (laughs) hopefully that's not how this world operates but i can forgive the movie for for the fact that they get together i mean obviously that's the formula you don't you don't fuck with the formula i just think it could have it could have restrained itself for from some of the more gratuitous moments i don't mind the dirty humor there's a couple of dirty jokes uh, with the name of bride that uh made me laugh I'm not, I'm not proud of it oh i mean i'm very proud of it i'm not above this <laughs> i've said it many times in the show i'm not above dumb comedy uh and i i laughed at the dumbest of parts in this movie i mean that part where they're where they're all touching or the uh, will ferrell and, and danny mcbride are touching that big vibrating <laughs> triangle and danny mcbride goes holly you should sit on this it's hilarious it's terrible but it's so funny i laugh my ass off every time um you know but that I, moment but, like, comes after one of the best moments of the movie which yes. is when they start singing uh that's the song by chair oh yes yes yeah. uh which i love i i will again that's a regular piece of 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 comedy in in my family now because of this movie um you know every time i hear that song i think of this and i laugh uh and um I've added it to playlists specifically because it makes me laugh now. Of course, um, that's a gag that it's funny removed from the, uh, I think removed from this era of comedy, but I can see how people who were already tired of Will Ferrell's shtick would have been tired of that gag. Oh yeah. I mean, look, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that if, if Will Ferrell's style of comedy is not for you, this movie's not for you. <laughs> no Will Ferrell. Well, I'm not even talking about you. like uh, for you, know? you. I'm talking about fatigue, which is a real thing. Yeah, I could get that too. I mean, 
I understand definitely getting tired of a formula or getting tired of I don't I don't subscribe to the thing that Will Ferrell's the exact same character in every movie, but I do think that there's a lot of similarities, you know. Um if you built if you built a, a graph, you know, there would be some overlap there. Um but it's hard to think that a Will Ferrell movie would work as well without those things like that's what makes his movies work so well and and not to say that he's he he can you know do movies that don't have that i mean he absolutely has shown that he can do that but the reason that those movies are special i think at least at least you know based on what i think you know a movie um uh, like stranger than fiction is because it's an outlier you know that's not what he does in every film um and I don't know. I, I guess the question that I would have for you is, um, at this time, 2009, if you saw this, do you think it would have played into any fatigue for Will Ferrell? Or do you think that you're just one of those people who can kind of take as much as he can give? Now, I will Are say, you asking I ran about, into that. About me as a, um, going to see this as a child in 2009? I mean, yeah. I mean, like even children can have fatigue from things. I mean, sure. uh, you know, we were probably... Uh, probably both 11 years old when this came out, I think. Uh, yes. So... Yes. 11 years old in 2009. And by that point I would have started discriminating. I wouldn't have just laughed at anything, but I feel pretty sure that I would have enjoyed this. I'm sure my dad wouldn't have. Uh, Cause I think <laughs> this has, this definitely has like all of the things that people didn't like about Will Ferrell. And I don't know how much of it, of it has the, uh, the things that won him praise in the first place. I think it has some of that, but it yeah. definitely, there's a lot of broad elements at work. I think those are countered by some really weird out there, like truly eccentric ideas that in a way it feels miraculous that they were able to get these into a major studio release, right? Like those aliens. Yeah. Oh yeah. Perfect example. Sure perfect example so now i think there's a lot of different elements of play here that are balancing each other out pretty well and will ferrell is not uh is not on an island by himself he has really good chemistry with all of his co-stars all two of them <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. I mean, but he, he, I mean, he, like, that's the thing though is like even smaller characters in this movie i think play really well uh, with our main cast. I mean, we have, of course, uh, you know, we talked about Chaka. <laughs> we have uh, other characters in the movie, though, that even though they're sort of playing a smaller part, I mean, Matt Lauer is an example. I think that Will Ferrell and Matt Lauer even play off each other, which is pretty um, They do. Uh, magical. Matt, Matt um, Lauer <laughs> is, there was this moment when reporters and television news anchors decided they were going to uh, shoot their shot for stardom so right yeah guys like matt lauer uh participated in 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 movies like this and you know i mean hey matt lauer skeezy guy uh but he clearly was a good sport for yeah his role in this movie and it truly was like uh kind of a perfect book ending to the film I, I agree, and but uh, like even playing off of some of the other things, I mean, like uh, Enoch, the character of Enoch, who is the uh, disgraced alien <laughs> lizard man, <laughs> who is uh, who is trying to take over the uh, take over every dimension, and um, who suspiciously wears a tunic. I have always loved that part of that scene where Danny McBride, the guy who, and, and that's kind of what I like about movies like this is that the idiot character is always kind of the one that makes the most sense, but not the right way. It's like when the teacher tells you to show your work and you do it and they tell you that it's wrong somehow. It's like, Oh, I got the right answer. Uh, but Danny, that's what McBride Danny McBride is, is in this movie. But no, that's, that's the thing. He is, he's right for the right reasons because he, rec I, I he mean, recognized yeah. the, <laughs> The tunic as a as a sign of deceit, as a symbol of Dude. deceit, which is exactly what that society uh, uh, meant the tunic for. So that shows you a couple things. Yes. And this is this is where like big brain screenwriter uh, yes. happens. Mm -hmm. This is where the big brain juices start flowing. So 
in in one joke they have foreshadowed um the true nature of this character of enoch right. and they've also foreshadowed how attuned denny mcbride is to this society yes and and you know what like it's what makes the ending work so much for me but i, I want to say before i talk about that ending um because i think it has to do a lot with his character and how likable that character becomes throughout the movie um, and I, I want to get more into Danny McBride, I guess, in just a moment here. But I like that not only does it come back that he's just an evil guy later, they literally bring up the fact that they gave him a tunic as a sign of his of his treachery. <laughs> that that's why these like elder aliens put him in a tunic. And then Danny McBride's character is like, see, man, tunic. Uh, it, the fact that it comes back as a joke uh, when it was could just be some throwaway trailer moment is very funny. Um, but but that again, this is going to speak to Danny McBride in this movie. And you said something earlier where you said he could very well be the MVP of this movie. I'm going to argue that he is because here is a character that could have easily been the butt of every joke in a movie like this, who could have been nonstop slapstick, getting hit by stuff, not understanding anything, dumb idiot character who just like happens to be right. That That's a trope that we get. But he's more than that, man. Like you start to really like this guy pretty much right away. I mean, when he's in the cave and he's, uh, and, you know, Will Ferrell's like, say what you will, but the man's a showman. And then he's like, man, I'm doing all this cool shit for you guys. You guys are giving me nothing. Uh, like he, you can see his eccentric nature, but it's like endearing. Uh, and, and every bit of humor that's around this character, I'm laughing. Um, and, and some of the humor doesn't land in this movie. Don't get me wrong, but like, if it involves this character more than likely, I'm laughing at it. Um, and by the end of the movie, you kind of buy that this guy is like, yeah, I mean, like, think of where he was when we met him at the beginning of this movie. I mean, this was the guy who was <laughs> trying to swindle our two main characters out of $30 so that he could go from owning this remote fireworks shop slash, <laughs> slash that he co-owns with a silent with a mouth Helms. breather. <laughs> with this with a silent ed helms um and it just just he's trying to turn that into a hotel and casino enterprise where he lives in a, the tip of it there's two tips and if his wife makes him angry he banishes her to the other tip <laughs> to be a slave for the rest of her life <laughs> this guy is insane and then he goes into this world of just absurdity and he seems to be the only one who's not getting caught up in BS the whole time. I mean, he's having the most fun. He's thriving in this world. And so when he stays in the end, that's kind of like a weird trope in movies like this, you know, where one of the characters gets left behind or stays behind because they want to be a hero or because there's no place for me in the real world. But you buy it with this guy. <laughs> he is He is going to be a king in this realm. <laughs> he's already got like, six or seven women is in yes. his harem by the end of the movie so he's going to be just fine <laughs> yes uh, let's and, not and you... question the patriarchal values that are being enforced at the I end mean, no. let's not even think about that i no. i instruct all of you to turn your brain off at exactly that moment uh at the end of the film you'll be better off for it no i mean again he is the mvp of the movie he unlike what the trailers might have um made me wary of he never graded on my nerves if anything he was something that always kept kept the movie alive kept it animated yeah. kept things moving kept the chemistry going and he's also the source of i think the real uh the real distinct appeal of this movie like every gag that i think i will remember this movie distinctly for like land of the lost that movie where danny mcbride and, and will ferrell trip out on <laughs> on mystical uh jungle shrooms and you know are almost they're almost chased down by a crab monster and then oh my god will ferrell makes out with uh you know a, a missing link no, he, he gets close to it and then starts going i don't want to do it i don't want to do it it's so funny man and like that's that's one of those things that could have easily been like oh, this has gone on too long, or like, oh, they overstayed their, this bit overstayed its welcome. But they kept finding ways to make it funny. Like, if first thing you see is Danny McBride, fucking <laughs> gigantic rings around his eyes, looking dead into the camera. You gotta be honest with me. You a cop? 
And then Chaka just says, Chaka? He goes, it's not an answer, Chaka. That's your name. And it just, it works so well. And then, and then it keeps going. And the crab thing is so funny because they're all dead silent the whole time. It's the whole scene. They're completely silent, but it's just, like, even the way the crab moves is funny somehow, man. It's just it, that whole sequence is, is how I feel kind of about this movie. It could have easily overstayed its welcome and been a bit that went on too long or bits that went on too long, but they and there all, are some bits that go on a little long, a little, a little long. I'll say, um, I think uh, I think even the ones that are still funny can go on long, and even if they're not, like the bug one is a good example for yeah, me, right? Where Will yeah. Ferrell's getting bit by the bug, and I felt like by the time he kind of came to and was like, "What happened?" I was like, uh, "Okay, I could see this time around, especially like this went on." But then Danny McBride saved it for me. <laughs> see, there was a bug. But He's that's the now. curse <laughs> of the new millennium comedy. Yes, the editing yeah. has been lost. Go back to classic uh, comedies, kind of like screwball comedies, maybe Airplane or one of those, throw it at the kitchen wall and sees what sticks approach. The reason those movies work is because the editing was tight. There is hours and hours of unused footage and it's unused for a reason because actors kept riffing and riffing. And then they picked the best gags and stuck them together. Right. So even though it appears like Oh, they're throwing all the ideas out there. No, no, no. They're they're filtering out all of those ideas to the best ideas. And I think uh, the loss of that of that filtering process is probably the thing that is most sorely missing from modern comedies of of at least film. I think television has to be more tightly edited, so it uh, seems to escape that problem because they have specific time slots they need to film. But right. what's the difference between? an hour and a half movie and now we're in a 35 minute movie and now we're in a 40 minute movie well you've actually kind of dragged out some jokes that could have been like instant classics in my head canon and now it's just right. a, it's a little diluted yeah and it, it that kind of plays into why i see more of the will ferrell fatigue nowadays and why i understand it more more way more than i understood like reading reviews and saying that people had Will Ferrell fatigue in 2009 is crazy to me because it didn't hit me until like a couple years ago. And now I do have it and I do just want to go revisit his classics. I'm not going to go see movies like Get Hard or Stray or anything like that because those aren't movies I, I want to watch anymore. Um, but, you know, these like it, it's sort of surprising to me. And I and but I guess not really because I, I can't I think it kind of plays into what you said there. I think if you have enough of this of a similar thing. And all of it is the most of it that you can possibly cram into an hour and 30 minutes. Well, it's going to get tiring. I don't know. I think the downfall there is also um, attributable to just the downfall of, of theatrical comedy. I can agree with that. I mean, think of how many movies have come out over the last few years that are comedy films that have been both commercially and critically successful, or at least just critically successful. I mean, there's not, a ton and they don't seem to be vehicles for stars the way that no that land of the lost is a will ferrell vehicle or black sheep a movie we talked about previously was a chris farley vehicle now that sounds like a lame thing to be nostalgic about because being a, a vehicle for a star doesn't really i don't know it doesn't really incline you to be a good movie but at least it has a foundation for something like at least it has a mission right. to do something and uh comedies rarely seem like they're on a mission these days that it, it normally seems like we're gonna get um uh, you know the the latest actor from snl maybe uh we're gonna get a wrestler like john cena pops up in a couple of these we'll get an actor who was funny 20 years ago and uh okay you guys have to stop your daughters from having sex tonight go <laughs> <laughs> well well see but that's why i think when a comedy does come out and it is like the comedies that we used to know and it's not trying too hard to do that i think that's why they're special to people i mean i haven't seen this yet but i i hear, I hear that that jennifer lawrence movie that came out last year i think it was called no strings attached mm -hmm. is that what that was called yeah um i heard that went over really well I, in my experience there was a movie that came out back in 28 uh 2019 i believe yeah 2019 two comedies that came out in 2019 that i really enjoyed uh good boys and book smart 
I think Booksmart was a good vehicle for those two. Um, Booksmart and- was really funny. It was not. It wasn't reinventing anything. But you no, don't have to. But no, and that's the thing. Like, I, just entertain me for however long you're keeping the movie on for, and let me walk away from it thinking that was funny. I'm gonna watch this again. Good Boys and Booksmart both did that, but that was 2019. We we're in 2024, and I can't. I'm looking through my letterbox. I don't see a single example. And and granted, I don't see a lot of movies. <laughs> okay, I don't have a lot of time on my hands. Um, so, so I'm, I'm a little behind on the, did you on see the Barbie here? I did not see Barbie. No, Barbie um, was, I heard was very that. good things about it though. Yeah. That, that was the comedy of, of last year. Oh, and of course there's the, uh, super funny, objectively funny, um, comedy by, um, by this really great comedy troupe, uh, okay. the daily wire. Okay. Um, I knew. Okay. <laughs> they... All right. Um, <laughs> what? I mean, whew. Do you want do you want the woke mafia to take over Hollywood? Do you want them to ruin comedy? Uh, Land of the Lost. Um, <laughs> no, I, I do want to ask you though. Seriously, you know, kind of going back to Land of the Lost, um, I wanted to ask you about some of the things that people have said about this movie in reviews that I've read, um, because there were some interesting things in there that I think don't really play into the fatigue as much of an actor like Will Ferrell that more so play to the superiority complex. (laughs) And I'm going to call it that because when you read these reviews, just go to Letterboxd now if you're listening to the show or anywhere, anywhere that aggregates reviews from uh, from audiences, right? You're going to ultimately see people who believe that they are above dumb comedy. And if that's what their thing is, you know what? Sure, go for it. If that's not your style of humor, humor is very subjective and it's very important in my mind to laugh and to 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 enjoy life and and you know have a good time. And if dumb comedies aren't your way to do that, then all power to you. Where I, I start know, I to think... get confused is like mm-hmm. where where people still go see these, knowing it's not for them. And I read that a lot in reviews where they were like, yeah, Will Ferrell wasn't for me, but I like sci-fi movies. So I went and saw this. Will Ferrell's the star of the fucking movie, okay? I, I, very rarely is he going to be in something that's not going to play to his strengths. That's why he's had the career that he's had. Even his movies that didn't do very well, the clips circulate of his scenes. <laughs> like Get Hard is a movie that didn't do very well, but his scenes circulate a lot. Kanye... Um, uh, uh quoted or no he actually took the clip of will ferrell from blades of glory and yes stuck he did it in a, a song he's my he's my favorite part of blades of glory um and and uh you know i don't know man i i guess the question that i would have for you is audiences i think pretty overwhelmingly called this movie unfunny right this is a comedy movie if it does not succeed, there are things outside factors that might play into that. But considering the reviews for this movie, a majority of the negative reviews are talking about the humor. A, do you think this movie could, do you think there's a justification for calling this a failure as a comedy for that reason? And B, is there any side of you that kind of sees where these people are coming from? Well, as I uh, mentioned previously we actually do have a metric on how to judge comedies it's by how much it makes you laugh so right. as a movie that made me laugh very consistently i don't know how i could say i didn't find it funny i can't imagine the headspace of somebody who doesn't find it funny the humor isn't for everybody i don't and right. if it was for everybody then it'd be a a broad comedy that would never find its audience it, you know comedy you know, it, it can succeed on a broad level, but the mission isn't to be all things to all people, right? It's a Will Ferrell comedy. It's, uh, I'm not super familiar with the creative team behind this, but I read that Adam McKay almost directed it. And I feel like that was uh, the mindset, you know, like, like pre the big short, you know, Step Brothers era, Adam McKay, you know, that's, that's what they're cooking with. It's stepbrothers with dinosaurs. It's the other guys with aliens. Of course, you don't have to like that. I I like some of those 
Will Ferrell vehicles more than others. But obviously I found this funny. And of course you have to acknowledge that there's going to be people who don't find it funny. Absolutely. There, and you know, movies I consider to be, you know, the movies that have made me laugh the hardest. There's a, there's a huge crowd of people that, that, you know, say it's not funny. I don't know how you can say that something is just not funny. Like people try to make it sound like they're an authority on the subject of what's funny. Yes. Right. Which that's where we have problems. And that, but that's just the problem we have with, with, you know, film discourse or any kind of discourse really in general, like people act like they're the authority on a subject, even when Completely there's agree. like, like there's no way you could be an authority on a subject like that. So I guess I want to ask you, does it surprise you that it's that seemingly a majority of people uh, are on the side of more non-funny than funny for this movie? I don't know. I think I doubt many people have given this a chance since 2009. I think it actually would benefit from a rewatch or, or people experiencing it away from the fatigue of will ferrell i reading some of the reviews that i did you know it really seemed like uh like will ferrell was was the target there or the kind of brand of comedy that i think he was associated with uh also i think people this is back like we didn't know what we were in for people were tired of reboots of like old properties that nobody cared about anymore and they just didn't realize what was coming ahead they didn't realize that they would have to make peace with um you know the reboot machine right so there's something very like people were were suspicious of this movie of the motives of the filmmakers <laughs> yeah uh so i i don't know how many people have given it a good faith chance i really don't i i i think this movie has an audience for sure it for sure does. I think this could be a movie that um, finds its appreciation much later. You know, where where kids like me grow up to have kids and then they show it to their kids. And I think, you know, maybe one day uh, word of mouth from this spreads enough to give it a, a solid cult following. Um, it's not there yet. Uh, and we are, God, 15 years removed from when this came out at this point, which is insane to think. Uh, but here we are. Um, and uh, speaking of here we are, um, was there anything else that you wanted to discuss about Land of the Lost before we delivered our final verdicts on it? Oh, we've covered the bases. I think it's time to deliver the verdict. I would agree. And I, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to start with you here. I know that you sort of described your final verdict earlier in the episode, but I'd like to hear like your overall final thoughts on the movie and give us that actual, but no, I don't think I, no, I haven't given you my final verdict. I think maybe Ooh, you'll be okay. surprised. Okay. I, let's, let's hear it. I went in expecting or, or was ready for this to be a chore was, I was ready for this to be a, uh, a reminder of why comedy fizzled out. Um, and has struggled to make a comeback in a big way. And I was ready to feel embarrassed for, for the people involved, namely Will Ferrell, who has been much more successful as a producer recently than as an actor, despite how much I, I love the guy. No, no, I was thoroughly entertained. I'm not sure if this movie is more than the sum of its parts, but the parts are very funny. They're very entertaining. Uh, it's left me like this movie has more quotable lines in its runtime than uh, I think uh, a whole stretch of of era of comedy has given for me in the in the past few years. You know, we know that comedy has struggled in the marketplace, and I think that's unfortunately because people rejected this weird, uh, kind of almost psychedelic bizarre vehicle for uh who was then the king of comedy and people have almost been scared to uh to broach the the subject of a true theatrical comedy uh since movies like this failed well this movie shouldn't have flopped it should 
be remembered as a cult comedy as as a movie with a real cult audience i think it will find that one day however slowly that happens and if not it will certainly have uh my respect and that's why i'm saying it's actually good nice okay I'm glad to hear that. I know you started this uh, by saying this was a, a not that bad experience. So I'm glad I, to hear. So I, that's not what I meant. I meant that this was the ultimate experience of going into a movie that had a terrible reputation and being bewildered by why people uh, had something against it. Okay. That's well, what I meant by go. that. Yeah. Well, uh, glad to hear that. And now here we go. Here we go. I got to talk about this movie from my childhood. Um, got to f- deliver my final verdict here. And um, all right, so so uh, Eurovision, Blades of Glory, Strays, The House. Uh, these are all movies starring Will Ferrell that have a higher rating than Land of the Lost on Letterboxd. Uh, that's a crime to me. Uh, this is a movie that I have loved for a long time. This is a movie that I will continue to love uh, for a long time. I will show this to my kids one day. I will uh, tell anybody who hasn't seen this before to get out there and watch it. Um, this is an awesome experience, uh, and I that has not changed for me over time. Uh, over Probably over a dozen times I've seen this now. I said that earlier in the episode, and my opinion has not changed at all. I think this is an awesome movie. And that is why I am going to give Land of the Lost, fuck you all, an actually great. That's right. Land of the Lost, actually great. Happy to say it. Uh, might make the list of my, of, of, um, of my top 20 favorite comedies to watch of all time. Maybe not best comedies. Uh, I think there are better ones out there, but um, I could watch this any day and, and have a good time. Yeah, so that's settled. Land of the Lost is officially a good movie. Yes. Yeah. Get back out there and watch it. What are you guys doing? <laughs> why? Why? When I look at this movie, are there so many worse movies in my mind rated higher than this? Why? Why does n- no particular star rating on Letterboxd has double digits? It's 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 in this, this the single thousands of, of ratings. We need to boost this. This is the definitive movie that deserves the not that bad bump. And the fact that it's not there yet is insane to me. But let's get it up there. Let's get this movie an audience. Uh, and uh, I hope everybody has uh, as good of an experience as, as either one of us had watching this movie uh, for this show this time around. Well, on that note, I think it's time to take us up. But first, we, of course, need to remind you guys that uh, there are a number of ways that you can support this podcast and <laughs> our mission to, to <laughs> reevaluate uh, uh, sadly forgotten movies like land of the lost yes. so of course you can support us on patreon where you can get a number of goodies and rewards for uh for your hard-earned dollars we offer exclusive episodes we offer merch like a sticker that you can slap <laughs> on anybody who is a skeptic of land of the lost or freddy got fingered or my bloody valentine 3d any of the movies that we've been defending slap them across the face and stick that not that bad logo right on their kisser uh or (laughs) if you're a a pacifist you can just uh you know donate put it on the yeah put it on the back of your car uh put it on 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 your fridge you know your favorite cup uh on a a refrigerator laptop whatever you want to do okay put it there uh, right. but uh yeah but uh, that's not the only way that there is to support us of course uh, we have other things that you can do instead of giving us your money although giving us your money isn't always a terrible idea uh you can uh, support us by heading to our website not that bad pod.com where we have a backlog of all of our previous episodes um pretty soon we're going to be uh, working on just kind of redoing the uh, website, at least uh, organizational wise, to make sure that everybody can find our season breaks and everything. So um, really excited to get that rolling for everybody. Um, you can find bios on your two favorite hosts <laughs> and how we how this show came to be. Um, and of course, links to all of our social media pages where we're happy to hear from you. Uh, this movie is a good example. Uh, somebody who I didn't even know listened to the show, uh, reached out and, and recommended it. And it's a movie I've been wanting to cover. And so 
I was happy to do it. And, and we'd love to hear from you guys, whether it's feedback on episodes, episode suggestions, maybe we'll get to it, maybe we won't. Sorry if we don't, uh, and you're welcome if we do. Uh, but we're happy to hear from you anyways. Um, at the very least, if you like an episode, drop a like on YouTube, share the video, the podcast version, whatever you can do, spread the word of Not That Bad. And let's give these movies the not that bad bump that they deserve. Um, and so thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, Mr. Tice, would you like to take us out? Yeah, all right, guys. This is Not That Bad signing out. Uh, we are leaving the realm uh, between space <laughs> heading, and time. Heading to the land of the lost. <laughs> and we're returning to our normal lives. <laughs> yes. So I'm Gabe. I'm Connor. And this is Not That Bad signing out.